Oogie dokie. Let's see if my recording goes better this week than last week. So one additional thing is we're going to have an extra quiz today in case you need an, an addendum to your quiz at the beginning of class. So I want you to either take out a piece of paper or open a Word document or whatever you want to do. And this is going to be an ongoing together quiz throughout the class. So you'll write down your answers as we go through questions. And then at the end of the class, you'll upload it to show that you participated. So I don't care if you handwrite it and you take a picture of it to upload it. I don't care if you make a Word document and then upload that. I don't care if you write them down and write them in like the text box of the assignment. However you want, as long as I can see what you put. All righty. So when we're talking about labor and birth processes, let's talk about the five P's first. So you do not need to memorize what are the five P's, select all that apply, but it helps you know what the, the components are of the birthing process. So when we're talking about the five P's, and we're going to go through each one individually more specifically, things like the passenger, which is the fetus, things like the passageway, which is the birth canal, things like positioning, mama's position. So all these factors come together to either create a good labor experience where things go normal and you have a healthy baby and mama, or a bad experience where you have complications. So any one of these that are disrupted can cause problems. And we'll talk about that when we get to complications. So when mama first comes into labor and delivery suite, there's three things we want to know. We want to know how mom is doing. We want to know, I'm going to cry over here because I think it's being loud. We want to know how mom's doing. We want to know how baby's doing. And we want to know how close we are to the main event. We want to know if we got a few minutes or if we need to start, you know, getting ready to catch. So vital signs will help us see how mom's doing, get us a baseline set of vitals. Checking the fetal heart rate helps to give us an idea of how baby's doing. And then cervical checks will help so we can see how dilated in the face she is. So let's talk about fetal positioning first. So the passenger can affect um, progression of labor, whether it be the size of the passenger. And we're going to talk about macrosomia babies. We talked about it slightly with diabetes last week. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know what? How's that? So that way y'all have light over there. Everybody can see, okay? Perfect. I, love, I like having both sides so we can turn one off and leave one on. Um, in the other building, it's either bright or death dark. And it's kind of kind of a pain. So um, as far as the size of the baby can affect it, we talked a little bit about macrosomic babies when we talked about diabetes, so a very large baby. And we're going to talk about shoulder dystocia, which is one of the problems you see with that. But also how babies position. Ideally, you want a baby to have their chin tucked, this part coming out first, head down, where they're all flexed up. Doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes they want to come out feet first. Sometimes they want to come out in this position, where which, i.e., that's not happening. But they're going to sit sideways. So there are various different ways sometimes they want to come out. This is ideal, where everything's all tucked and, and flexed and ready to come out. So when we're describing our, um, and I'll flip back and forth between the two slides just to warn you. Um, so when we're describing how the passenger is positioned, these are the terminologies you need to know. I would recommend just highlight that entire slide, just color it in, highlight it, you know, big stars, know the entire thing. Whoops. So the first thing we're looking at is presentation, and that's basically which part is coming out first. We're only going to focus on three of them. There's four as far as the other one being the shoulder. If they're like this, then the shoulder is coming out first. But we're not going to really focus on that one as much. So it could be their head, where you got a cephalic presentation, and then we can be more specific, whether it's the back of the head or the chin. It could be breech. When we say breech, it means they're coming out this way. And it could be something we call a footling, where the foot's kind of hanging down through the cervix. Or it could be where the feet are drawn up and their buttocks first. But basically, their head is up instead of down. And again, the other one, it could be shoulder, where they're sideways. And this presentation is going to correlate to the second letter down here. 
this word is what we're really going to go into detail talking about. So your other term, lie, it's how baby is lying. There's only two types. There's longitudinal, which is up and down. So this is longitudinal and this is longitudinal. It doesn't matter whether it's head first or behind first. Both of these are, they're long. Come on, let's find. Transverse is sideways. So it could be like this. Could be like this. It doesn't matter. If they're sideways, it's transverse. If they're up and down, it is longitudinal. Then there's attitude, and there's only two options for this as well. Attitude is the relate the technical term, the relationship of the baby's body parts to each other. So basically everything is flexed, which is what we like, or extended, which is like this picture right here. That is not a very comfortable way to give birth because that head is pressing into that sacrum and causing pain. So ideally, we want flexion. You see how babies all flex up. And the head is mostly what we're focused on, whether the head is flexed or not. Or the neck, I should say, whether the neck is flexed. So attitude is either flexion or extension. And again, that could be if baby was upright, they might have their head flexed or extended. But generally, we're more focused on it when they're head down because that can make a difference in progression of labor. I'll skip position for just a second and come back. So let's talk about station. Station is this picture you see right here in the middle. So station is how far down the birth canal baby has progressed. Zero station is at the ischial spines. Now, we don't x-ray mamas to see where the ischial spines are, uh, but typically that's right about where her cervix is. So when, when you see baby's head right at the cervix, they're right at zero station as far as what you can look at, um, what you can visualize. So then when we're getting into other numbers, negative is higher up, negative is farther away. Positive is farther down. They're positively coming. They are pulling into the train station. Ha ha, station, it's pun intended. I know when I was in nursing school, one of my instructors taught me plus four hit the floor. So four centimeters down, you're about to slide right on out. So positive numbers are further down, negative numbers further up. Any questions on those so far? So let's talk about the big one, position. And I did post in your weekly content on week three a practice sheet. Now I will tell you some of those pictures are a little hard to tell. And I get it. If you look at the key and you're like, it don't look like that. Don't worry about the, the significance of the pictures. If you understand what, like, say, transverse and anterior and posterior and all that means, that's what I'm really looking for. Not so much that you can interpret the crappy picture. But this is kind of what they look like. So we're looking at which way baby is facing inside the mom. Because that can make a difference of how labor progresses. It can make a difference of what kind of symptoms she's having. Uh, for example, if the back of baby's head is towards her sacrum, if baby's facing like this, she's probably going to have more back labor because of that back of that head sticks out more than the face and it's pressing into her sacrum. So if she's having a lot of back labor, oh, this is why. So, as you see, I have labeled myself. Let me pull my shirt down. And I'm sorry if the ones in the back are backwards because I couldn't see. So, we're looking at pretend I'm the mom. And when I'm showing you, pretend the baby is inside of me, not in front of me. So, the easiest way to do position is do your middle letter first. Don't try to do the first letter because you need the middle letter to figure out the first and the third letter. So, the second letter is going to be what part is coming out first? So when we look at this picture, in this case, it's an O for occiput. Baby's chin is tucked down. So this part is coming out first. Don't bend baby's necks like this, please, when you're in clinical. But for exaggeration, <laughs> baby's neck is tucked. So this back part of his head, the O, is coming out first. And that's when you have that flexion. 
So we can have an O, back of the head. If baby's extended like this, that's a mentum. And I hope I don't pop his head off like I did yesterday. Don't tell Ms. Culver. Um, <laughs> mentum, M-E-N-T-U-M. So mentum meaning chin. So instead of the back of the head coming out, their chin's coming out first. So we would call that, if the, they look like picture B, we would say that's a mentum presentation. So then this is pretty easy. That's your sacrum. And it's going to be the back side of baby. So where the sacrum is on their back is where you're looking at where that points. So sacrum, and again, we're not going to focus on shoulder, but if they were sideways, then they would be a shoulder presentation because that's the part coming out first. Not that it would come out that way, but if it did. So we're just going to focus on the first three, though. Occiput, mentum, and sacrum. So first you have to figure out by doing your Leopold maneuvers, and no, you do not need to have to describe to me, first you feel this part, and then you feel this part, and then you feel this part. But we use Leopold maneuvers to feel what baby's position is in. Um, it can help us not only to figure out what their positioning is, but also to figure out where their backside is so we know where to put the fetal heart rate monitor. Because ideally, the best place is going to be on their back because you won't have extremities all in the way. So first thing we need to figure out, what part of baby is coming out first. So once we have this middle letter, then we take whatever our middle letter is and match it up to the body parts on the mom. So we match it up with either right or left. So right or left. And then we match it up with either anterior, posterior, or transverse, which is directly to the side, completely sideways, not catacorner. And most babies, like you see in this picture, are catacorner. They're not straight like this, for example. They're going to be, sorry, baby, let me move your legs out of the way. They're, God bless. They're going to be like this, and if y'all can't see me. So they're not straight like this. They're usually kind of crooked like this. So let's say baby looks like this inside. So, and their chin is tucked. So the presenting part is what? Occipital, very good, the occiput. So we need to figure out which way, based on this occiput, which way is this facing? Not which way is baby looking, but which way is this facing? It's, is it facing my right or left? Very good. It's facing my left, mom's left, so it's left. Occiput, is it facing my anterior or my posterior? Anterior, very good. So that would be an LOA, left, occiput, anterior. Make sure you're matching up the presenting part, not which way baby's facing. And that's usually where most of y'all get confused at, and I admit it can be confusing. You're looking at, okay, well, baby's looking that way. Why isn't it posterior? Because we're matching up whichever part is coming out. Now, let's say, let's move baby this way. And let's say this time they're extended, and it's the chin coming out first. Very good, exactly. So we, we established first, we got our middle letter, which is mentum, M. So we need to figure out which way the mentum is facing. Now, in this case, it is the way baby is facing, but most of them it's not. So it's facing to my right side, and it's facing to my anterior. So right, mentum, anterior. Now, when we're talking about sacrum, again, it's which way their buttocks are facing. So if we did baby... Let's, let's mix it up a little bit. If we did baby this way, so we know we're going to do an S. So S is our middle letter. Left. Left. Very good. I was trying to trick y'all, and it didn't work. I love it. That's exactly what it would be. So if he was facing, he or she, I'm sorry to genderize. Um, if he or she was facing sideways, that's exactly what it would be. It would be S for the middle letter, and it's towards my left side, and it's transverse, because it's not crooked, it's directly straight sideways. Did any of those not make sense? 
Is it easier to understand now with a visualization? So basically take whatever part is coming out first and match it up to mama's body parts and directions. Transverse is sideways. So, and I know I'm not exactly so side. So if it's directly to the, if it's facing a little bit towards the front, it's anterior. If it's a little towards the back, it's posterior. But if it's completely sideways, it's not curved either way transverse directly sideways absolutely you all pass you can go home i'm just kidding i can't make it that easy but that is probably one of the things that i know a lot of people struggle with i do encourage you to do those practice worksheets just so you can get familiar especially with the terminology and things like that but figure out your middle letter first and then you're going to compare that middle letter to the first and the third letter Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. I didn't talk about it because so yes, th that's a great question. So SC means scapula. So it's talking about that shoulder blade, whichever way the shoulder blade is facing. So if um, let's say baby was like this, we would do um, left SC anterior because it's facing towards my front. Test. We wouldn't have a picture. We would just like describe some parts. Maybe. <laughs> you can do it. So that is fetal positioning. Any questions? And then that's the one I was showing you before the four presenting parts. And I wouldn't focus on shoulder too much. We don't focus on shoulder. So here's your first question. Don't yell it out. Give everybody a chance to look and read and see what it is. So a nurse is assisting with the care of a client in active labor at 39 weeks of gestation. The nurse locates the fetal heart tones above the client's umbilicus at midline. The nurses suspect that the fetus is in which of the following positions? Is it cephalic, transverse, posterior, or breech? Take a second, write your answer down, and then we'll talk about it. Y'all got your answer? What is it? Breach. It is breach. Very good. So this is kind of, I will tell you, this is a little bit easier than you can expect on your test. So don't think, ooh, this is easy. <laughs> so it is breach. Because when we're looking at the umbilicus, granted, this is a little bit big for a newborn. But if baby is breach and we're looking at above the umbilicus, we're looking where that, that heart is, where that chest is. If baby was head down, cephalic, we would find the heartbeat down below the umbilicus. So that can help you as well. Good job. So our second P, if my pointer won't, oh, there it goes. My second P is the passageway. And the book goes into great detail talking about the different types of pelvis configurations. I do not want you to even worry about those. It's not important. So there are different types of pelvises and pelvic shapes. Typically, women are this gynecoid one, and you see it, it's kind of similar to a roundish, babyish shape. So it's a little bit easier. Most men have this android. Baby wouldn't fit through that very well. So if a woman has that body, that pelvic shape, it could make it very hard. So the biggest thing, not, not, not necessarily knowing what the different pelvis configurations are, but this can interrupt labor as well, depending on the shape um, and the size as well. So the birth canal is what we're talking about with the passageway. So the powers. So our third P is powers. This one is really important. So there's two types of powers. There's the, the involuntary ones, which is your primary. So it's the contractions. You can't control those. They happen whether you want them to or not. And that is helping with cervical dilation and effacement. That's helping that cervix open up so baby can come out. Our second one, our secondary powers, is the actual pushing. It's voluntary. Mom is physically pushing baby out. So those are voluntary. Between the two of them, you put them together, and baby comes out into the world, hopefully. When there's disruptions in one of those, like their contractions slow down or not strong enough, or mama's not able to push effectively because she's tired or she has an epidural or whatever it is, 
then you can start having problems. So don't worry, you're not gonna have a test question of what is the size of 10 centimeters compared to the food? But that gives you an idea as you're visualizing what 10 centimeters looks like, for example. So dilation and effacement is how we describe the opening of the cervix. And most people have heard of dilation, but maybe not effacement. So dilation is how big the hole gets, and it goes from zero to 10. So 10 centimeters are fully dilated. Effacement is the thinning of the cervix, and that's where you see in this middle picture. You see it's real thick right here. It thins out and shortens. So it starts getting shorter and shorter until here. It's basically just a lip on the edge of baby's head. So the effacement is the thinning out. Um, Compare it to eating a lifesaver. So when you eat a hard lifesaver and you suck on a lifesaver, as you suck on it, the lifesaver ring gets thinner and the hole in the middle gets larger as it gets thinner. So it's kind of the same thing. As that lifesaver gets thinner, the hole in the middle is getting larger and those two work together similar to this. Usually effacement comes first, so it'll start to thin and then dilation can happen later. So effacement we describe as percentage from zero to 100. So if you're 100% effaced and 10 centimeters dilated, you're ready to roll, hopefully. Which you could be 100% effaced and only be, you know, six centimeters dilated. Effacement will come first. Um, the nurses that do it are really good at figuring that out. Um, they're able to figure um, when they feel, when they do the cervical check, they're able to tell how basically how deep the cervix is. Don't ask me, but I know that's how they do it. I've done it in simulation. It's not the same. And just like when they're measuring um, dilation, they get really good about knowing um, based on how far they spread their fingers, what centimeters it is. And if you ever need, not even just for this, but in general, if you ever need kind of a down and dirty way to measure something, you don't need exact measurements, if you look at your pointer finger, from the tip of your finger to that first knuckle is approximately an inch, and the width of your finger is approximately a centimeter. So if you're looking at a wound and you're like, oh, that looks like about two centimeters, if it gives you a, like a quick. Now, if you need exact measurements, don't do that. But it's a quick down and dirty way to get an, an approximate measurement. So those are our powers, what's pushing baby out. Our next P is positioning. How do most women give birth? Exactly, the lithotomy position on their back with their legs in the air. This is the absolute worst way to give birth because you're fighting gravity. Not to mention the fact it's uncomfortable. Baby don't wanna come out that way. But usually it's convenient for the doctor and if they've had an epidural, it's usually safest as well. The best way is squatting. The reason for this is because of gravity. So when you're squatting, and sometimes they'll squat down even lower, um, I'm not gonna demonstrate because y'all are not picking me up off the floor, but they can squat down and that way it still leaves room under, under the bar where um, they can grab baby. So these bars, um, hospitals now have these. It attaches actually to the bed frame. It's called a squatting bar and they can hold on to it so they don't fall. This would not be ideal for somebody with an epidural, of course, because that could be a big safety risk. They could fall because of the loss of sensation. But for somebody who doesn't have an epidural, it's a great option. This is another good option too on their hands and knees. It opens up that, that pelvic outlet um, and allows more room. So sometimes the labor is not progressing very well. Mama keeps pushing and baby's not coming out and she's getting tired. They might have her flip over on her hands and knees because it changes the position of the baby and mom and sometimes allows baby to come out that way. So position can make a difference. And then the last P is psyche. We're not really gonna talk about psyche too much, um, but psyche is just basically mom's mental health status. So various different factors can affect labor as well. If mom's having, maybe she just had a death in the family, that could affect her, her, her progression with labor. If mama is having, she already knows it's a stillbirth, versus a mom who is expecting a healthy newborn, those would be very different outcomes that could affect her psyche. If she doesn't have good support people, she's, you know, all these women that 
At one point, they were having them birth alone during COVID. That could affect their progression. Any questions? So let's talk about the stages of labor. So there are basically four stages of labor. Now, the fourth stage is postpartum, and that's something we'll focus on more when we do postpartum. But the fourth stage is like the recovery stage. The first couple hours after birth, mama's vital signs are stabilizing, baby's stabilizing, you're establishing breastfeeding if that's what they chose. Everybody's just, you know, getting back to normal as best as they can at the moment. So today we're focusing on the first three stages. Um, there is a chart on page 73 in your ATI book that lays this out, if you like to see a visual. So the first stage of labor is labor. So it's that time when they're going from zero centimeters to 10 centimeters. While that cervix is dilating and effacing, the progression of labor. That's the first stage. That's the basis of it. That's really all you need to know. Second stage is the actual birth of the baby. So from the time they say, mama, you are 10 centimeters and 100% of face, we're ready to go, until the time baby's feet exit, that's the second stage. So that's the birth of the baby. And then the third stage is birth of the placenta. So from the time baby's feet exit, we're transitioning into the third stage. And once that placenta, placenta has exited, then we're ending the third stage and going into the fourth stage, the recovery stage. So there's not really a whole lot of details to know specifically to each stage, more how you care for the patient during each stage. Stage one is a lot of supportive care, monitoring, things like that. Stage two and stage three, keep the mom safe, watching for complications, and so on and so forth. And then stage four, of course, helping her with recovery. And then there's the mechanism of labor. So do not memorize this at all. Um, this is a good visualization, though, to show you that babies don't just shoot straight out. They actually have to twist and flex and turn to get around the pubic bone and all of the structures in order to get to the outside world. So that's where you can get problems like that shoulder dystocia, for example, as they're twisting and flexing, then that shoulder gets stuck and they can't come out. Any questions? Super exciting, huh? Or maybe just for me. So I will tell you this pain management chapter is probably the shortest chapter in your entire course for the semester. Because most of it is as far as what we're covering. Because most of it, it should be stuff y'all already know. I'm not going to tell you what morphine is because by now, hopefully, you know it. We'll talk about the specifics of what you need to know related to labor and birth. So when we're talking about pain during labor and birth, it will progress based on what stage they're in. And you do not need to memorize. During this stage, they have pain here. And during this stage, they have pain here. But it shows you that it does change. Um, like when women, they'll start complaining, I'm having a lot more back pain, or I feel like I'm going to have a bowel movement. Uh-oh, sounds like baby's coming. So the, as the pain changes, that can help you also know, one, the progression of labor, but also if something's wrong. But then we have perception of pain and expression of pain, which can be drastically different. Um, in some cultures that are very stoic, they may not express much pain. They may never scream or yell or, or even say that they're in pain. It doesn't mean that they're not. It's just their culture. Um, their perception of pain can vary as well. Those factors I talked about as far as they can affect with mom's psyche that can affect uh, progression of labor can affect pain as well. Again, if you have a mom who is expecting a healthy newborn versus a mom who already knows they have a stillbirth and they're still having to go through labor, that can affect their perception of pain. It can make it a lot more difficult on their pain, um, controlling their pain level if they're having a difficult time psychologically. So everything is categorized into non-pharmacological or pharmacological. And a lot of times women in labor and birth will use a combination of the two. Some women will go all natural, more power to them, but 
it is an option where you only use the non-pharmacological methods. The good thing about non-pharmacological methods is they're safe for everybody. There's no side effects like you have with medications. They're not going to dull your experience of, of the birth. Um, they're not going to delay birth. So epidural sometimes can not yet yeah, delay birth, make labor last longer. Um, that's why epidurals, they won't put in until you're at least three or four centimeters because it can actually stop the progression if they put it in too early. So here are some examples of non-pharmacological pain management. So what she's doing in the picture, y'all know what that's called? Yeah, counter pressure. But yeah, she's probably massaging as well, but that's that sacral counter pressure. So if you take the heel of your hand and push against their sacrum, if they're having back labor where a baby's head is pressing against that sacrum, if you push counter pressure against it, it helps kind of push baby's head off that bone and relieve some of that pain. Um, heat and cold we use. Um, a lot of places are using essential oil aromatherapy. A lot of hospitals actually have a diffuser in the rooms now, so you can use those. Hypnosis is a big one the book likes to focus on that you'll probably see again. And then breathing. So in the book, it goes through specifics of in this type of contraction, use this type of breathing, et cetera, and so forth. You do not need to know that. The biggest thing I want you to know is recognizing hyperventilation. So that is a very real potential. When they are not breathing properly, they can hyperventilate. People with anxiety do it. People in pain do it. Um, and if they start hyperventilating, they can actually change their pH. So what can we do about that? If they're hyperventilating, are you going to tell them to calm down? How well does that work for you if you've ever told somebody calm down? Well, right? What can we do about it? What's that? Yeah, exactly. Give them something, you know, nobody hyperventilates with these on a bit. Because you breathe them back in, you CO2. Not really, but um, paper bag, that's a great way. Um, anything that you can kind of cover over the face so it forces them to breathe back in that CO2 and decrease that pH. A lot of times in the ER, what we would do um, when we had patients that would come in with anxiety and they're breathing fast, I need oxygen, I can't breathe. We would take an oxygen mask that's not hooked up to oxygen and put it on their face. And I know you're about to say, oh, my God, that's so deceitful. Exactly. It actually has two purposes. It is the psyche part of it. So they think they're getting oxygen, and it helps them kind of get themselves together a little bit. But it also serves the purpose of it's covering their face, making them breathe back in that carbon dioxide. So it has kind of a two-part process in helping with that. And you're not giving them oxygen. So lots of techniques for non-farm. And then we have lots of techniques for pharmacological. So when people think of pharmacological pain management in labor and delivery, they usually think of an epidural. It is very common to get epidurals. Um, but there are other methods. You can get IV medications. Um, you can get spinal blocks. Um, so an epidural and a spinal block are inserted the same way. Usually spinal blocks are put a little bit higher. Um, but the difference is a spinal block, they insert the needle, they give the medication, and they take it back out. An epidural is kind of like an IV where they insert the needle and then they pull the needle out and a catheter is left in place where they can continue to give you additional medications throughout. They can also do local anesthesia. So, for example, if they need to suture because you had a tear um, of the perineum, they can just inject a little lidocaine locally at the site if they need to. They can also use nitrous, which my understanding is they're not really using nitrous right now because of COVID and the aerosolization and all that stuff. But nitrous is a great drug for labor and delivery because it has an extremely short half-life. Um, it kind of went away in the medical field. The dental has been using it forever. But in the medical field, it kind of went away. And then labor and delivery is what brought it back. And now you see it in lots of places, the ER, even pediatrics everywhere. Um, and the reason it's good is it's such a short half-life that you can use it just when you need it. So you're having a contraction. They can take the mask, put it on their face, breathe in the nitrous. Then when the contraction's over, they can take it off and be able to walk around and things like that. That's one of the downfalls of an epidural. You can't get up and walk around. It can make your legs significantly numb. I will tell you, when I had my first one, I felt, I could tell I didn't have much feeling in this side of the leg. I was trying to lift it up and I couldn't move, I couldn't lift it. 
So I decided, let's see how far this will go. So I knocked my leg off the bed and I couldn't pick it back up. I had to actually take my hands, pick my leg up, put it back on the bed because it was so numb. So it really can completely knock the sensation out of you. So the last one that's rarely used is general anesthesia. So general anesthesia is where they intubate you, completely knock you out like they do in the, uh, the operating room. General anesthesia has a lot of risks. And for most labor and birth, even C-sections, it's not necessary. Um, you can do that with epidurals. So general anesthesia, sometimes people electively choose it. Um, but you can also get it if it is a emergency. Um, epidurals take a few minutes to not only put in, but to work. Usually epidurals take 30 to 45 minutes before they're effective because it actually the medicine has to go down to your feet and work its way back up. So it takes about 30 or 45 minutes. So if you have an emergency and baby is dropping their heart rate, you don't have time for that epidural to kick in to do that C-section. But with general anesthesia, they can knock you out in a minute. So they'll use that for emergency situations. So as far as the epidural, the biggest risk of insertion of the epidural is what? Does anybody know? Hypotension. So nerve damage is actually not as common as you think. A lot of times people think, oh, my God, they're going to paralyze me for life. Um, as long as they know what they're doing, it's pretty uncommon for that to happen. But hypotension is a very big risk. Um, if you've gotten an epidural, more than likely they gave you a big old bolus of fluid before they put it in. They will usually give you a liter bag of fluid before they put that epidural in. And that's what they're trying to combat. They're trying to prevent you from dropping your blood pressure. So this is what it looks like. Giant old needle, and they insert it into the back. Usually, with women um, that are pregnant that are in labor, they're usually sitting upright, and the nurse will stand in front of them, and they have the the woman kind of lean over the nurse's shoulder, so that way it helps poke the woman's back out, so they can find the vertebra a little bit better. And then it goes in this little epidural space the catheter does, so we can give them medication going directly to the nerves. So question number two, a nurse is assisting with the care of a client who had an epidural anesthesia block during the early stages of labor. Client's blood pressure is 80 over 40 millimeters of mercury and the fetal heart recording is 140 per minute. What action should the nurse take first? What can you do the quickest that might make the most difference? Very good. So could all these answers be correct as far as actions you could take? Absolutely. All of these are probably things, and more than likely, you're probably doing them all at the same time. You're telling mom to turn over, and you're increasing her fluids, and you're putting her, you know, you're probably doing it all at one time. But the thing that you can do the fastest that will have the most impact is turn her on her side. I told you that would be the theme of the day. Turn her on her side. So all these are correct as far as actions we would take, but we're looking at what would we do first. So when you're looking at priority of action and you're reading answers, think of what could make the most impact in the shortest amount of time to a better outcome. Yeah, and especially the, the best side, is the left side. So if you've got mama's blood pressure dropping, if you lay her on her left side, it opens up that vena cava so she has increased blood return up to her heart. So that way it will circulate and hopefully get her blood pressure back up. And then the fluids, of course, will add volume. It helps everybody. Just lay on your side. Any questions on pain? And I told you, it's the shortest chapter of the entire semester. Because most stuff about pain, you're going to know. All right, y'all take a break. Come back at 145. At 150, I'm sorry, I have read wrong. And then we will talk about fetal assessment. All right, let's resume.
to the other part that people have difficulty with, fetal assessment, which we went through veal chop and y'all are now experts, right? Absolutely. So one of the things we look at is the characteristics of the contraction. Um, the two biggest things when we're talking about contractions, especially with external fetal monitoring, is frequency and duration. Those are the two big ones you should know. So I'm just gonna turn this on for a second so you can see my drawing. So frequency is how often they're happening. So when you're doing a heart rate, for example, every heart rate, that's how often it's happening. This is how often. So it's from the beginning of one to the beginning of the very next one is frequency. And this is described in minutes. So when somebody says they're having contractions five minutes apart, they're talking about frequency. It's how often they happen. So the beginning of one to the beginning of the very next one. And we describe that in minutes. Duration is how long one contraction lasts. So it's from the beginning of one contraction to the end of the very same contraction. And these we describe in seconds. So you may hear them say, She's having contractions every five, that are five minutes apart, lasting 60 seconds, for example. So frequency is how often, duration is how long that one contraction lasts. And they'll do like an average, usually over a 10 minute period. So when we're talking about resting tone, um, resting tone is how relaxed the, the uterus gets. Or else from this, did y'all get that already? I know it wasn't much to write, um, is how much the uterus relaxes in between contractions, um, which is really important because when the uterus is contracting, baby's getting squeezed, which means baby is not getting oxygen during that time, which if you're having a 60 second contraction and they have a few minutes to recover from that, it's fine. But if you're having contractions one after another and baby doesn't have time to recuperate that oxygen before you start having another contraction, that's where you can get something called uterine hyperstimulation, which we're gonna talk about when we get to complication. So we're looking at frequency and duration to make sure they're not too close. And we're also looking at resting tone because if the uterus is not completely relaxing in between, that's not giving baby time to reoxygenate and recover from those contractions. And that's where you can start getting those decelerations. So I talked about internal versus external fetal monitoring slightly and said we talk about it more. So external fetal monitoring is probably what most of y'all are going to see. Um, it's where they have the two pucks, I call them, where they sit on their abdomen. One is measuring the contractions. One is measuring the fetal heart rate. Now, if you're really concerned, and I mentioned this when we were talking about high risk, they can do an internal monitor, and that's kind of what it looks like. They've got this catheter up next to baby measuring the contractions, and then they got this little scalp electrode sticking in baby's head to measure their heart rate. That is a little bit higher risk. So, of course, they're not going to do that on everybody. That's reserved for if they really need to know specific numbers, like they need to know how strong those contractions are, for example, instead of just seeing when they happen. So question number three. Oh, wait a minute. We're going to wait for question number three. I forgot I moved it. I didn't move it in here, but I moved it up there. So this describes what we already talked about, veal chop. And this gives you a picture. So you see on this one, these are accelerations. They're random. They're fine. They're great. Baby's doing great. Variable, again, they're kind of all over the place. They don't coordinate with the contraction. They could be concerning. We'll try and move the mother, see if it fixes it. And then your late D cells. It occurs right after the contraction. And those are your ominous ones. These are what we call non-reassuring fetal heart rate patterns, meaning we don't feel very good about those. What's a normal fetal heart rate? 110 to 160. I think I heard it mumbled somewhere. 110 to 160 is our normal fetal heart rate. So if they're below that, it's bradycardia. If they're above that, it's called tachycardia. Very good. You all pass. So I know we already went over that. 
And if you want me to, at the end, I'll raise it so y'all can, if y'all needed to copy any more thing more, know your veal chop. It will greatly help you remember what causes it, what it looks like, and what you do about it. And then this is veal chop. So here is your question. A nurse is assisting in the care of a client in the second stage of labor. Which of the following findings should the nurse report to the provider? A bloody show from the vagina, uterine contractions lasting two minutes, pelvic pressure with contractions, or early decelerations in the fetal heart rate? Which of those would be concerning? Y'all think B? Survey says you are correct, B. A two-minute contract, and when it's saying lasting two minutes, it means two minutes of duration. So for two minutes, baby is getting squeezed and not getting oxygenated. That is too long. Contractions should not last more than 90 seconds. If they last more than 90 seconds, it's called uterine hyperstimulation, which we're going to talk about it again um, when we get to complications. So if they are occurring more often than every two minutes, so if they're having more than five contractions in a 10-minute period, because usually they look at 10-minute strips to get an average, they're having more than five contractions in that 10 minute period or every two minutes, or they're lasting more than 90 seconds. That is too much. Baby is not recovering and you're gonna start seeing those late D cells. So the other ones, bloody show from the vagina. Guess what, you're having a baby, that's normal. Same thing with the pelvic pressure. You expect that, especially as baby's coming down at the birth canal, they're gonna have that pressure. And then early D cells means what? Head compression, very good. So. Not concerning, just means progression of labor. Now, if that had said late decelerations, that would have changed the entire context of the question. And this is where we talk about uterine hyperstimulation. You'll also hear it called uterine tachycystole. So you should know both terms. So uterine hyperstimulation or uterine tachycystole is where the uterus is just working too hard and baby's not recovering. So again, more than five in a 10 minute period, which means they're happening more often than every two minutes or if they're lasting more than 90 seconds. So if you think about that, if they're having a contraction every two minutes and it's lasting 90 seconds, how long does baby have to reoxygenate? 30 seconds, that's not long enough to recover from 90 seconds, 90 seconds of not being oxygenated. So you'll start seeing babies start having the late D cells, then their heart rate will start bradying down and it's not gonna be pretty. Yes, ma'am. Uh, tachycystole, sorry, hold on. I'm almost kind of light on so you can see it if you can't see it. Tachycystole. So you'll see both terms. I think one of your books uses one term and one uses the other. But you'll see both. So what could we do? Turn it on her side, maybe. Um, if she's getting oxytocin, we want to shut that off because that's probably what's causing it. She's getting a little too much medication. But her uterus is working a little too hard. So question number four, actually, I just gave you the answer, I think. A nurse is assisting in the care of a client in active labor. The nurse notes late decelerations on the fetal monitor tracing. Which of the following actions should the nurse take first? Should she elevate the client's legs, position the client on her side, administer oxygen via face mask, or increase the infusion rate of the IV fluid? Very good, which I gave you the answer. So why wouldn't, whoops, dang it. Why wouldn't you want to give her oxygen? Not only that, it's not going to get to baby. So there's a reason we teach y'all ABCs. If you have an occluded airway and you give somebody oxygen, where's that oxygen going? Nowhere. It, it has nowhere to go. So think of the, um, um, with, with baby being squeezed, it's like cutting off their airway. They're cutting off the umbilical cord or cutting off the, the transfusion of oxygen. 
So giving mama oxygen is not going to do any good until you fix the problem of cutting off the, the airway to the baby. So that's why you do ABCs. Very good. Any questions on fetal assessment? Veal chop. Know it. So let's talk about how we care for the family during labor and birth. So in the first stage of labor, a lot of it is monitoring. A lot of it is comfort care. A lot of it is um, assisting with um, making her comfortable, getting her what, he, you know, uh, what she needs, assisting with epidurals, you know, that kind of stuff. Monitoring vital signs, doing things like urine testing, and et cetera. So these are a lot of the things we're doing. We're checking out baby. We're checking out mama. We want to make sure nothing's going awry. And one of the things we'll look at when she ruptures her membranes is what does the fluid look like? So that picture at the bottom is amniotic fluid. Is that normal? That is not even close to normal. That is what we call meconium. So it's kind of a greenish color. And that is where baby has had a bowel movement in utero. That is a problem. Normal um, amniotic fluid should be clear or it might have like white flecks in it from the vernix that, that covers the baby. But otherwise it should be relatively clear, clear, not colored. If it's like that clearish greenish color, watery greenish, Meconium, if it's yellow or white, purulent, cloudy, infection. If it has an odor, infection. So we want to be watching her closely for this as well as fetal heart rate. Once the membranes rupture, we really want her to deliver within 24 hours. Um, it's not where they'll force you to, but it's better within 24 hours. Because once you hit that 24-hour mark, you've opened up that sterile environment for 24 hours and the risk of infection greatly increases at that point. So again, a lot of the our jobs are gonna be assistance with the mom, monitoring for complications. On page 390 in your textbook, it talks about some of those complications like the uterine tachycystole, for example, um, the meconium amniotic fluid. So that is a very good reference for you to look at. Uh, 390. You're welcome. So as we go into the second stage of labor, this is when baby is being delivered. So part of the nurse's job is monitoring again for complications, seeing they're watching the fetal heart rate monitor, making sure baby's tolerating. Um, oftentimes holding a leg and assisting with the process of the birth, um, which is probably what you may do in clinical when you go. So it depends on what baby number this is for how rapidly this progresses. If they've had children before, this stage probably will only last about 20 or 30 minutes. If they've never had a baby before, it may last a couple hours. So it's gonna depend on how many babies they've had previously. So second stage is when they're fully dilated, fully effaced, and this is when baby comes out. So part of second stage of labor after is maybe performing an episiotomy, which is where they actually cut the perennial tissue. Yes, ma'am. Not really. Yeah, and that's what I'm going to talk about. So um, episiotomies are not as common as they used to be. They used to be pretty common. The thought process behind an episiotomy is one, if you cut it, it opens up a bigger hole, making it easier. And the other thought was, if you cut it, it is easier to suture a cut line than a jagged line where it's ripped. But think about what happens whenever you impair skin integrity. It further impairs skin integrity. So if you take this paper, for example, pretend that's your perineum. And this is the, the edge of the vagina. If you tug on it and it's intact, it would take a whole lot of force to tear it, right? But let's put a little cut in it, an episiotomy. You can probably guess what's going to happen. It rips right open. So that is why they don't do episiotomies anymore, because it can actually make lacerations worse because you have impaired the integrity of the skin 
further increasing the problem. What they recommend now, and usually it's good to start this a few days before, is what they call perennial massage or perennial stretching. You'll hear it called both, um, where you actually take usually oil, um, like mineral oil, for example, and you actually rub the bottom of the perineum closest to the rectum, and it stretches that perineum out, so that way it's less likely to tear. And that's ideal. A lot of midwives and doulas are, um, are big on that. But they don't typically do episiotomies. You'll see old school doctors that still do it, but they're not very nice. So let's say your mama did have an episiotomy or a tear or whatever it be. What can we put on their bottom after they deliver to help them feel better? Ice. Very good. So ice is a vital necessity in the postpartum mom. It helps with bruising. It helps with discomfort. They make the pads where the ice pack is built into the peri pad. So that way you just apply it and it's not only absorbing the vaginal discharge, but it's also providing comfort to mom as well. So they're a great invention. There are different uh, degrees of lacerations. I don't want you to memorize what the degrees mean. You can have like a, a first degree where it's just almost like it's just a, a la um abrasion all the way up to if you see in that picture the bottom left hand side that is a fourth degree where it actually tears the wall that separates the vagina and the rectum so they can have it tear all the way up that wall which of course causes long-term complications um, and often surgery to repair that so birth is no joke So if you, if you ever have babies, tell them, I do not want a episiotomy. So the third stage of labor is when this friend comes on down. This is our placenta. If you've never seen a placenta before, my placental parts have fallen off. The Velcro gave out. Um, if you've never seen a placenta, this is about real life size of what it is. It's usually about a size of a dinner plate. They're pretty big. So when we get to postpartum in a couple weeks and we're talking about how postpartum hemorrhage is the number one cause of postpartum mortality, you see why. This is a giant wound for that uterus to contract down and stop bleeding. So the placenta birth is what happens in the third stage. And they'll inspect it. Um, they'll look at the shiny Schultzy side, which is the baby side, the maternal side, which is the dirty Duncan. It's the bumpy side. Not that you need to know that. Um, but they'll also look and make sure all the pieces are there. So we actually have a placenta where the pieces are designed to come off. So when we do simulation, this actually goes in our Noel sim mannequin. Um, the students can look and see, oh, wait, something's missing. So what do you think they do if they see, oh, there's some placenta missing? They go get it. That's exactly what they do. Because if they don't, and when we get to postpartum, we'll talk about this, if they leave those placental fragments, that increases that risk of postpartum hemorrhage, even sometimes when they go home, as well as infection. So they will take their hand and go get it. Um, I personally cannot speak to that. Um, but it does provide, um, I, like it, it's, heavy, it's heavy concentrated in iron. It has a lot of nutritional benefits and um, a lot of times people will get it and put in capsules. They can send it to a company and put it in capsules and they take the capsules like a medication to, it makes your hair shiny and all kinds of stuff apparently. I don't know. Uh, I told them they could keep on. And then as we go into that third stage, then we're talking about four stage, um, which is that recovery. So getting baby to the breast, inserting them on breastfeeding if that's what mom chooses to do, um, making sure vital signs are stable. Um, but all that stuff is more stuff we will focus on when we talk about postpartum. Any questions? So let's talk about what can happen when things don't go the way we want them to. Labor and birth complications. And one of them is preterm labor. So we talked a little bit about what preterm labor is last week. So any labor that happens between 20 weeks and 37 weeks and six days is preterm labor. So you could have preterm labor and they're able to stop it and not have a preterm birth. If then you give birth during that time, then you have a preterm birth. So there's a lot of things that can cause preterm labor. Um, we talked about last week how just being dehydrated can cause it. 
having a UTI can cause it, bacterial vaginosis, even poor oral care um, because of the inflammatory process that happens when people have poor dental hygiene, that can stimulate uh, preterm labor. So there's lots of things that can cause it. Yes, ma'am. Which in your book, and I know why you're asking that because so last semester a student was like, but it says 37. And I was like, wait a minute, I remember seeing this. So I went through actually in your book in two different places, one place it says 37 and one place it says 38. So as long as you know that average, you know, 37, 38 weeks. It won't be like, okay, baby was born at 37 weeks and five days. Are they preterm? But, as long, but it really is written two different ways in, in your ATI book. But, you know, 37-ish, 37 to 38 weeks. So preterm labor, and we'll talk a little bit more about preterm as far as how it affects the baby when we do newborns. We'll talk about high-risk babies and preterm birth and how that affects the newborn. We're more talking about what we're doing about it while they're in labor today. So when we're talking about preterm labor, first we have to recognize it and see if it's truly labor or if it's Braxton Hicks. And then figure out what we need to do about it. Sometimes women, if they, if they lay down, they drink some water, like that dehydration thing, if they drink a bunch of water, it can help stop the contractions. They'll try that first. If not, then we can give them tocolytics, which are, it's not my time. So those are the four most common ones, endomethacin, nifedipine, max sulfate, and terbutaline. Mag, the most common. Terbutaline, the second most common. And again, like I talked about last week, know your mag. You will see it a lot. The problem with these medications is they cause a lot of side effects. If you've ever had mag, it makes you feel like poo. It makes your heart rate... Um, it makes you tachycardic. Um, it makes you feel kind of weird. Um, it can have a lot of side effects. Yes, ma'am. Of magnesium? Not to stop labor. They give a shot for fetal lung maturity. Can anybody tell me what it is? Very good. So, yes, they do. So, we give beta methazone, and what that does is it helps promote fetal lung maturity if baby is premature, and hopefully when they're born, they won't have respiratory distress. So I talked a little bit about amniocentesis last week, where we use it earlier in pregnancy to test for genetic defects. Well, this is another time we can use amniocentesis, where we're testing for fetal lung maturity, and they do something called an LS ratio, and you don't need to know what the normal number is. It's a two to one or whatever. <laughs> but it is where we're seeing how mature their lungs are, and a big part of that is whether they're producing surfactant or not yet. So when we do that test and it's abnormal, we can give mom an IM injection of beta methazone, and that will promote baby's lungs to develop before they're born, ideally at least 24 hours before baby's born, so it has time to take effect. So tocolytics, assessing for fetal lung maturity, preparing for potential of fetal demise, preparing for potential of NICU, So on page, I just saw it, 426 to 427, it actually talks about mag and terbutaline. Four twenty-six to four twenty-seven. You're welcome. So I just gave you the answer to this one as well, but let's see if you remember. A nurse is assisting with the care of a client who's experiencing preterm labor and is scheduled to go, undergo amniocentesis. The client needs an amnio to determine what? Weeks of gestation, gender of the fetus, maturity of the lungs, or anatomic abnormalities. In this case, you are correct. Maturity of the lungs. If we were doing it at 14 weeks of gestation, then we might be looking at gender um, genetic defects, things like that. But right now, we want to make sure baby's lungs are developed enough that they're not going to have complications, or if they are underdeveloped, we can do something about it before they're born. So, aside from preterm labor, 
there's premature rupture of membranes, and they're not the same. Premature rupture of membranes just mean the membranes rupture before contraction starts. So I know in Hollywood, you see on movies and TV where she gets up and, oh, look, there's a big puddle and her water breaks. It doesn't actually happen that way, usually. Most of the time, people have contractions start first, and then those contractions cause the cervical dilation, which stimulates the breaking of the water. But it can happen. And that's what the biggest thing to know about premature rupture of membranes is time, how long their membranes are ruptured. So more than 24 hours, we want to either get them antibiotics or try to find a way to get baby out of there because we'll, they'll get concerned with uh, infection. I had a poor mom who tried to hold a baby in for five days with rupture of membrane. She was 21 weeks, which right now with current science, we cannot save a baby less than 22 weeks. Um, and she was 21 weeks, so she tried her best. They admitted her. Um, they talked to her about um, that it was not going to, um, to work this way. She tried her best. She held that baby in for five days. And then one day she woke up and baby had just kind of slid out on his own. That one was heartbreaking. But she was so close. So when you hear the word dystocia, it means abnormal labor. So oftentimes you'll hear dystocia associated with shoulder dystocia, which that's one type. But dystocia just means one of those five P's that we talked about is abnormal. It could be she has a small passageway, could be baby's very large, it could be that her contractions aren't strong enough, but something is causing dysfunctional labor or dystocia. And there's tons of causes. So if that happens, we may need to induce or augment labor. So induction and augmentation are the same process, just the terminology is different. Induction means you're not in labor at all, and they're starting it. Augmentation is where you're already in labor and either the contractions die down or stop. So they're giving you something to kind of get you geared back up. And there are many ways to do this. Some of the medications that you'll see, um, oxytocin is the most common one. Make sure you know oxytocin. We're gonna talk about it this week and we're gonna talk about it in postpartum as well with postpartum hemorrhage. So oxytocin is an important one. The other ones that you see, um, mesoprostol, Methylergonamine, hemabate. Those are all ones that they'll use to, to um, stimulate contractions as opposed to stopping contractions. Um, they can even do manual methods, like sometimes just rupturing the membranes will help start that process because it, it stimulates those hormones. Um, if you've never seen an amni hook, which is what they use to rupture the membranes, it looks like this. It looks like kind of like a crochet hook with a little beaky hook thing on the end. And they reach up in there and they put a little hole in it. They can do something called um, membrane stripping, where, and they'll usually do this in the doctor's office where they actually go in and they use their hand to kind of pull the amniotic sac away from the uterine wall. And the stripping of it, pulling it apart, will often stimulate those hormones to start getting it into, getting it into gear. Usually women that get that done go into labor within 24 hours. So there are different ways we can kind of nudge it along. If they're having trouble with getting baby out, maybe baby's that macrosomic baby, a couple things you may see them use is forceps and vacuum extractions. They don't use these quite as much because they can cause injury and trauma to baby um, if they're used incorrectly. Um, most commonly you'll see, we call them stork bites. They'll get like the bruising along the side of their face where that um, forcep is clamping. The forceps look a, a lot like just a big pair of tongs like you use on the grill. And they actually put them around baby's head and help pull. And they might even need to kind of twist them if they're in a position where they need to be moved a little bit. So let's talk about cesarean birth. So cesarean birth is where you do a surgical incision to open up to take baby out that way. You all know what that is. There's two types of incisions that you can have. Most women have what we call, you'll hear it called a bikini incision or a low transverse incision. Most women have that. It is the best because it heals the best. And it's also much like, less likely to rupture if they have a baby later. So if they want to do what's called a VBAC, 
which is a vaginal birth after cesarean, you have to have this low transverse incision. If you have a vertical incision, you cannot have a VBAC because the risk of rupture is too great. So once you have a vertical C-section incision, you will always have to have a C-section because with the way the muscles run, not to get into A and P too much, but with the muscle, way the muscles run when you do vertical and it splits them that way, um, they're much more likely to rupture during labor at, um, later on. So most commonly, the reasons that we're going to do a cesarean birth are either vaginal birth is contraindicated, like for instance, your mom with herpes, HIV, the placenta previa, um, or it could be babies not doing well, like the cord prolapse, for example. So my old video that I had was so fantastic. YouTube took it down because they said it was not appropriate. But I found another one with this really cool new device that I want to show y'all. If you've ever seen any kind of abdominal surgery done, they use something called spreaders. They're like these metal hook plate thing where they use to spread the skin open. So they use something different. It's like a plastic bag that they wrap to hold the skin open. It's really cool. It causes less trauma on the tissue. It allows the opening to be larger so they can see what they're doing. Did they use the, the bat? That's awesome. I hadn't seen one when I was looking for a new video because they took my video away. I saw it and I was like, oh, that's awesome. I love how you can verify your account on your phone. It makes it so much easier. And there's no sound to this, so don't worry about volume. But if you've never seen a C-section, here you go. And you'll see them cut through the layers. It's not where they can just rip you open. They actually have to cut through each individual layer through the fascia and the skin and the muscle and the uterus, all separate. If they're not in a hurry, it can take a little while. If it's an emergency, they can cut through it faster, but obviously more risk of complicated. So this is the spreader. It's really neat. So they stuff it in kind of around the uterus. And then they twist it down to tighten it and it pulls, it retracts the skin, opening the hole up so they can visualize what they're doing. Makes you want to go to the OR, right? No. <laughs> And then there's the uterus, and you'll see them rupture um, the amniotic sac in just a second. There you go. There's all that amniotic fluid. And they're going to pop baby out. And as you know, surgeons and OB nurses manhandle babies. So there's baby. And as you can tell, if you haven't already, it is a large baby. Oh, yeah, the body's even worse. That's probably why she's having a C-section. But that is a big baby. A baby. And then when they need to suture, it allows them to have this big window to visualize what they're doing. And then they just pull it out to suture up the road. They, they already took it out. So they'll take it out after they take baby off. They just didn't show that part. And then it gives them an area to suture. Pretty cool. Yes. So usually vertical incisions are only if it's an emergency because you can, you can cut this way a lot quicker. So if like baby's going to die, if you don't get them out in a minute, um, they might do that one. But otherwise, most of the time they're going to do the horizontal incision. They used to do vertical incisions years ago before they realized, you know, the issues. Could be.
Now, the good thing about cesareans, there's actually less risk of postpartum hemorrhage, which we'll talk about that in post when we do postpartum, because even though you're like, oh my gosh, they're having surgery, it's more controlled. They actually go in and they scrape the inside of the uterus to kind of make it clamp down and stop the bleeding. Like during the actual process? I gotcha. Which, that, yeah, that absolutely can happen. All right, so you're going to know the answer to this, I'm sure. A nurse is caring for a client who wants to know if it's possible to have a vaginal birth after cesarean birth. What would be your response? Would you tell them there's so many variables you'll have to ask your provider? No. For one, there's not a lot of variables. For two, that is one of those passing the buck answers that we talked about NCLEX doesn't like. You're putting it on somebody else. The primary consideration is what type of incision you have. What you think? Yes. That is our answer. So that is the primary consideration is whether it was a vertical or a horizontal. It's too soon for you to be worried about that now. We never tell that. We never say don't worry. And the other one, a repeat cesarean section would be safer for you and your baby. Absolutely not. It's still surgery. It's major surgery. Um, so unless there's a contraindication to a vaginal birth, vaginal births are typically going to be safer. So let's talk about some of these emergencies. So there's three on here. Shoulder dystocia. So shoulder dystocia is typically seen with your macrosomic babies. Um, so you see it in diabetics a lot where baby is coming down and baby gets their shoulder gets stuck on that pubic bone. So a telltale sign of this is what we call turtling sign. So when mama pushes, head comes out a little bit. And then when she lets go, it goes back in. It comes out, it goes back in. And you'll start seeing that head going back and forth. And that we call that turtling, just like a turtle. Um, and they may also start dropping their heart rate and things like that. So shoulder dystocia is an emergency. You can't take them to the OR. You don't have time. You need to get baby out. So guess what you as the nurse get to do? Super pubic pressure. So, and I have a video, of course. I love visuals. Hi, I'm Kimberly, and I'm the owner. What is this mess? <laughs> it's the hands. It's the hands. Yeah. There we go. So this is a um, represent. So whenever you go to trial for things, like if it was a fetal injury, they have to do a, a animated mock-up to show where the fault may have been. So that's what this is. This was a company that created a mock-up of what happened in a situation to determine if it was the fault of the doctor or if it was something that was unavoidable. So you see, they put mom in a McRoberts position where they pull her legs back. Um, and when you have women that are laboring and they pull their legs up to their ears, that's what that's called. So in this case, they did an episiotomy. <sighs> Baby starts coming down. Everything looks all right at first. And then baby's shoulder gets stuck. And you see that's that turtling. Baby's head comes out, goes back in. And the, what's highlighted in yellow is your brachial plexus. So very commonly, you'll get those brachial plexus injuries on there with these. And it can be permanent. So we got to get baby out now because the head is burst, but not the chest. So they can't expand their chest. So they're trying to breathe and they can't. So they're suffocating. So the nurse is doing super pubic, or yeah, super pubic pressure to kind of pop that shoulder out from underneath. While the doctor's trying to reposition, it ain't working. Oh no! And we'll do it again. So try and insert his hand, see if he can kind of get up under that shoulder. That doesn't, why are you, dang it, YouTube, you're irritating me. So then she does it again, she or he, pop that shoulder out from underneath. So that is shoulder dystocia. It is an emergency. You don't have time for a C-section. Baby has to come out vaginally and we got to force them out. So they can get, clavicle fractures are very common with this which we don't do anything about. It just has to heal on its own. And then permanently, they can get the brachial plexus injuries. So I've mentioned prolapsed umbilical cord several times. Um, prolapsed umbilical cord is like you see in the picture. This would be what we call a complete one. 
So there's different levels of a prolapse cord. It can be like this where you actually look in the vagina and you see that cord hanging out. And you know, oh shoot, that's a problem. But it could be where the cord is up here and it's occult or hidden. It's right next to baby's head. So you see the heart rate starting to drop, but you're not seeing the actual cord. And that's what you would think. So again, the most likely time, yes ma'am, I'm sorry. No, please. Yep, so usually when that happens, it's gonna be the variable D cells. So when you, and usually this is most common to happen um, when they rupture their membranes, especially if baby's head is not engaged where it's fitted in that cervical opening, then you'll have that cord that gets pulled down. But yeah, absolutely, they can do that, but it's gonna be more variable D cells. With this, you'll start seeing late D cells or even um, just bradycardia as it trends down. Um, so it could be hidden, occult, or it could be visible. There's a couple things you do in this situation. Hey, pray, that's one of them. Another thing you do, so we can reposition her, not on her side this time. I know I gotta mix it up on you. We can put her in Trendelenburg, so it kind of, the gravity will hopefully pull some of that pressure off. But another thing that we're often probably gonna do is somebody is going to, ideally with a sterile gloved hand, take their hand, stick it up in her vagina, push that baby's head up off that cord, and they're gonna stand there until they get to the OR and they take that baby out. So get comfortable if that's you, because it's gonna be a while. But you use your hand to push that baby's head so it relieves some of the pressure on that cord that's right next to it. Until you, But it is definitely gonna be a C-section. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And then the last one, uterine rupture. So the, the uterus can absolutely rupture, it can split open. Um, more likely if you've had a cesarean section, but it does happen sometimes where there's no previous history. So uterine rupture, some of the symptoms you'll see, one, obviously severe pain. Um, another one is the contraction just stop. If you have a muscle that's torn, it's not gonna contract. So the contractions just cease all of a sudden. Another thing you'll see that can be unusual that can speak like, what's going on? Is if they have pain in their upper back between their shoulder blades. Because what's happening is as that uterus ruptures, it fills the abdomen up with blood and it's irritating that diaphragm and giving them referred pain up in, in the middle of their back. So obviously this is more than likely gonna be an emergency hysterectomy. Depending on the severity of the rupture, they may be able to fix it, but. So if you have a nurse assisting with the care of a client in the first stage of labor, and the nurse notes the umbilical cord protruding from the vagina, what is the nurse gonna do? Prepare for an emergency cesarean, cover the cord with sterile moist saline, explain to the client what's happening, or place the client in the knee to Chester Trendelenburg position. So, Three of these answers are things we would be doing, kind of like the other one, all answers are correct, but what are we gonna do first? So the first thing we're gonna do is either, which I know in your ATI practice test, I can't remember if it's A or B, um, it, it has a question similar, but the answer instead of the positioning is using your hand to press up on the head. Both are correct. They're both correct interventions. You're just trying to get pressure off of that cord. So in this case, with the answers we're given, we want to reposition her in Trendelenburg or knee to chest. So are we gonna prepare for her in emergency C-section? Absolutely, but that's gonna kind of come afterwards. Kind of the same thing with explaining what's happening while we're doing this. Hopefully you're talking to your patient so they're not panicking while you're, you know, got your hand shoved up in their vagina. And then covering the cord, that, that one's just not even correct. So for your last three points, I want you to write down three topics we talked about that you know you need to go back and look at. Might be more than three. And then that will be, it's not open yet, it opens up at three. So after three, you'll be able to upload it. It will only be open till four. So don't go home and forget about it, do it before you leave. And again, either you can do a Word document, if you hand wrote it and you wanna take a picture of it and upload that, that's fine. If you just wanna type in the text box of the assignment, what your answers were, all of those are perfect.
And now we're going to, well, that's not what I want. Now we're going to see if you remember anything I said today. Does anybody need a break real quick? Yeah. Go for it. So take y'all like a 10 minute break. Five, 10 minute break. Stretch and pee and drink and whatever you need to do. What I say? Yeah. 